This video is sponsored by One Punch Man Road to Hero 2.0. Yo ho ho, Thriller Bark is bananas, but one thing I can say for certain is that for me, this wasn't the best arc so far. Now that's not to say that there aren't good, great, or even peak One Piece moments dotted throughout, but for a crucial part of the overall story being told, I found myself much less invested or interested in what was happening on screen. I still liked a lot of stuff, but damn, some aspects really didn't do it for me, and by the time things were wrapping up with the main story, I was getting kinda bored. But, like a phoenix rising from the flames at the speed of light, this story immediately after returns to peak One Piece again. So. What did I think of it? Well, grab your favorite Tim Burton posters, some pumpkin pie, and a whole bunch of patience because I'm totally not Mark, and this is my first impressions of, thoughts on, and review for a creative, albeit slightly messy, spooktastic adventure on Thriller Bark. But before we dive into the material for this week's video, I want to quickly thank and talk about today's sponsor. One Punch Man Road to Hero 2.0 is an officially licensed strategy card mobile game of the RPG variety, featuring the voice acting and storyline from the hit anime One Punch Man. You know, you might have heard of it. Who's in it? Saitama, Genos, Boros, and even that weird Crablante guy's in it. You can even see those drawn on nipples with markers. Now that's attention to detail. This game's got over 50 heroes to collect, it's got tournament PvP, it's got puzzle modes, mission modes, boss fights, and need I stress, it's got Crablante's fake marker nipples. I've personally had a blast playing it between chapters over the last week and if you'd like to get your hands on it too with some perks while also helping out the channel download One Punch Man via the links in my description and enter the code Zero to Hero to get a special bonus 10 free recruit tokens for one multi summon. So what are you waiting for? Collect those heroes, unleash your epic ultimates, and show me what it means to be a hero for fun. And for God's sake, send me screenshots of you finding Crablante's marker nipples on Twitter. All right, back to the video. Okay, so just to be upfront with you guys, while there were aspects of this arc I really, and I mean really liked, there was a relatively large section of this story that I would consider to be important that, to be honest, didn't really work for me. And I will be explaining in detail why I both enjoyed and didn't like certain parts of this arc, but I just want to make one thing clear before I do. Whether you hate everything about this arc or whether it's your favorite, my opinions in this video aren't more important than anyone else's. These are just my first impressions, nothing more. With that said, I will give reasons for every single take I have regarding the story of Thriller Bark and why it was, for me, the first moment Oda actually felt human in the entire story of One Piece. I mean, it took almost half a thousand chapters to get to what I thought was a bad chapter, so it's ridiculously impressive I managed to get this far without complaining. Those who've seen my Dragon Ball GT videos know exactly what I'm talking about here. Thriller Bark is essentially a mystery adventure rescue story focusing on a very different theme that becomes unavoidably obvious when we arrive on Thriller Bark. And while I will have a bit to talk about regarding portions that I didn't like, I actually enjoyed a considerable amount of the core story told here, specifically the beginning and the middle. So let's talk about what I really enjoyed in this arc first before I discuss the things I thought could have been reworked a bit more. <laughs> Kicking things off, I thoroughly enjoyed the fact that Oda gave us time to enjoy the crew in their new ship, during which they come across a literal mystery box in the ocean that once open sends up a giant flare. At this point, I knew what was coming, but I really liked it nevertheless. Almost immediately after, a ghost ship carrying within it a living skeleton called Brook floats on by, and almost immediately after meeting Luffy, he asks him to join his crew, to which Brook says yes, of course. While I thought this was in character for Luffy to do, it distinctly didn't feel like an earned addition to the crew, and I think that's by design. And thankfully, this greatly changes throughout. But what I found really interesting about this sudden recruitment was that despite having been offered and having accepted the position at the beginning of the next five volumes to come, which covers the entirety of Thriller Bark, Brook isn't at all featured as a straw hat towards the front of the books, which honestly acts as a nice bit of foreshadowing regarding what happens later regarding Brook's flash back in past, so I really, really liked that. But to be honest, from the get-go with the character of Brook, I wasn't overly fond of him. I don't particularly like perverted characters, and from the outset, he seemed to be much more raunchy than Sanji was. 
That is, until later in the story, but don't worry, I'll get to that. Ignoring that for now, Brooke thankfully becomes a much deeper, more interesting character full of unique problems that tie very much into the history of the established story within One Piece. The presence and introduction of Brooke, however, in this instance is less about the crew thinking they've recruited him and more about what he means for the story. He goes on to explain why he is the way that he is due to a devil fruit he consumed, giving him a second chance at life and also points out that a sinister someone has taken away his shadow and thus cannot go into direct sunlight without dying. Also, every second line he speaks is a pun. Soon after coming across Brook, the ship gets dragged into Thriller Bark, a massive island floating in the middle of the ocean surrounded by fog. Immediately, an ominous tone is established successfully, leading to Brook immediately running away across the water, which is on its own an interesting thing to see, but what I love about this beginning can be seen immediately after. Apparently, the flare sent up earlier was a signal to this place known as Thriller Bark to take their ship. Apart from this beginning setting up a specific goal in retrieving the lost shadow of Brooke, apart from it paying off the barrel in a successful manner, what I love is that while approaching this new island, Oda takes the time to explore the new improvements seen to the Thousand Sunny, demonstrating a bunch of new features courtesy of Frankie. One in particular being a small tribute to the Mary that, and this is the awesome part, connects the crew with the threat of Thriller Bark itself, creating a whole bunch of motivation and tension for the story. Additionally, something I thought was really clever before exploring Thriller Bark was how Oda establishes right away who among the crew doesn't want to investigate the spooky spooky island and who does. Chopper, Nami and Usopp are those such people that want nothing to do with it, but when out testing the new mini Mary craft, they don't come back leading those on the ship who did want to go investigate, i.e. the most competent people, left worried for their safety. Now we have two goals as a reader. Get the shadows back to restore Brooke back to normal, despite him after running away, and to retrieve the now lost crew. The second goal is exceptionally important as it gives the characters a reason to explore the new island and to establish the surroundings for the reader while also attempting to fulfill the narrative goal. It's a fun idea that works, I think, extremely well. After this point, there's just a whole mess of mystery and conflict, and from this point we start slipping into the second act of the story, which takes up a large chunk of the overall narrative, which I also largely really enjoyed the same way I did at the earlier parts of the story. Small character moments through Nico Robin demonstrating that she loves adventure and isn't scared of much, proving to be much more curious and less scared than anything else, is exactly what I was hoping for from her, helping her feel very distinct from Nami too. What's more, and something I referred to multiple videos ago during the Skype arc, was how Robin would refer to everyone not by their name, but by some other impersonal moniker, like Big Nose referring to Usopp or Navigator referring to Nami. However, now in context, in contrast to that, Robin refers to everyone by their name after the events of Annie's Lobby. It's incredibly subtle and so easily missed, but for those that do notice, it really helps these characters feel all the more human and likable, with this specific instance of that satisfying that she is allowing herself to get close to these friends. It's a beautiful thing to see and honestly really appreciate it. And following this little nugget, as readers we are bombarded by information of this world and its inhabitants, watching as the gang get ambushed, attacked, stalked, kidnapped and all the other things, featuring classic horror tropes and favorites like ghosts, zombies, the invisible man and even Frankenstein sort of much much later, which is a really cool idea on paper to build your story around. If nothing else, this arc certainly has its own unique voice and feels distinct from literally everything else I've come across thus far in the story of One Piece which is something I also very much enjoyed. But this section of the main story, I believe, is the absolute strongest part. So let's break down why I thought this was really effective and clever. As I explained earlier, Oda took the time to establish who among the crew wanted to explore the island. He then took those among them who didn't want to explore it and sent them in first to discover everything, as it's always more fun to watch those uncomfortable in a situation try to figure it out and stay cool. Through them, we meet a three-headed beast, some zombies, and a whole host of monsters before arriving at a haunted haunted house where they meet another key character called Dr. Hogback. In this haunted house, a whole bunch of crazy stuff happens to them as we watch the less scared portion of the crew, led by Luffy, experience the exact same tribulations but in a much more funny way due to their not being scared. This is enjoyable to watch only because we are comparing it to Usopp, Nami and Chopper's experiences with them. Circumstances like this reinforce character for both parties and I found to be massively entertaining. I specifically burst out laughing as I watched Luffy shove a zombie back into the ground. I don't think I've ever seen someone try to do that before, and when I saw it, I just burst into tears laughing. Once Luffy is done doing the Rubberman hokey pokey all over these bleeding tick 
Yes! The gang encounter a man that gives us our first taste of the most important character in this arc. One of the seven warlords of the sea, Gecko Moria. And in what becomes a really nice swerve in the story, the floating island of Thriller Park happened to be the largest ship in the world, captained by none other than Mr. Moria himself. That moment in particular was a moment I sort of kicked myself for not predicting sooner. Sanji, Zora, and Luffy, in a really unexpected turn of events, all get their shadows gobbled up and placed into other zombies. Those zombies now all have their powers, and for the time being, all those that had their shadows stolen are unconscious back at the ship. This leaves just Frankie and Robin, the two newest additions to the crew, to demonstrate what they are made of and allows them to get more time in the spotlight, which I really, really enjoyed. Also, there's this super cool creepy spider monkey thing that is absolutely terrifying and totally the stuff of nightmares. And on top of that, Robin can fly sort of question mark. So that's pretty tight. Not going to lie about that. And also this is sort of tangential to everything that I've been saying thus far, but I had to address it here. The amount of times that this particular arc mentions, quote, the new world was quite striking, which I suppose tells me that we're going to be going there at some point. So I'm going to leave that Chekhov's gun right there for the time being. Anyways, to cut a long story short, Luffy's shadow is thrown into this giant ice monster that is way bigger than a typical giant should be. And in a fun turn of events, when the shadows are absorbed initially, the residual personality of the shadow's owners takes over the zombie's vessel for a certain amount of time, which leads to a really interesting dynamic the crew have to later face. They have to fight a giant Luffy. The shadow absorption mechanic is cool and everything, but it comes with a restriction that required Moria not to take out Sanji, Luffy, and Zoro. And so they left him on the ship, ready to reconvene with the rest of the crew once they made their escape. So at this time, Nami is still captured by a really awful, awful character that I hate, and Luffy's shadow is acting like a fool everywhere. A bunch of the crew are missing their shadows, and so a new deadline is introduced to create suspense. And it does it quite effectively. And that deadline is Sunrise. Since they lost their shadows, the sun will now kill them if it hits them. Them being the strongest fighters in the Straw Hats, so sort of a big old deal. With this problem now facing them, Luffy shines like the true main character he is, opting to go straight to the root of the problem, Moria. Citing that if he can beat him, the shadows will return to their normal owners. It's another wonderful example of Luffy adding to the story by being so straightforward and clear cut, wanting to take out the problem at its source by taking out one of the warlords of the sea. And while Luffy is left to pursue this course of action, the rest of the crew decide to take out individual zombies looking for their own shadows respectively, to act as a sort of contingency plan in case Luffy's doesn't work out. And with the added mission of still rescuing Nami, during this portion with the Straw Hats, there are four secondary fights that take place against the underlings of Moria, and I love three of them. I'll save the other one for a later point in the video. So let's start with... Chopper versus Dr. Hogback. I haven't really spoken about him too much in this video, but Dr. Hogback up until this point has been the villain that has honestly had the most buildup and backstory explained to us. He's actively lied to every one of the Straw Hats he's met, put them all in danger, kidnapped people, and has resurrected their corpses using Moria's powers. The place exists because of him, and so needless to say, I was more than invested in seeing this psychopath get taken down along with his warped view of how morality and the world works. Additionally, Chopper, I thought, was an ideal candidate to face off against this guy, as not only are they both doctors, not only was Dr. Hogback established to be a huge inspiration to Chopper while he was studying medicine, but also because their philosophies as it pertains to helping people are polar opposites. As we learn, Dr. Hogback's motivations are entirely driven by greed, highlighted through the character of Sindri, who he specifically rose from the dead just to serve and be with him despite her utter refusal to do the exact exact same thing when she was alive, which is just all sorts of messed up, and provides a more than interesting through line for Chopper to work with alongside Robin in a tag team effort against them. And perhaps the most interesting aspect of this fight was the internal struggle Sindri was fighting to foil her master Hogback's plan resulting ultimately in his defeat, which is a nice little narrative trick proving that Hogback lost and was defeated simply because of who he was, which is always incredibly satisfying for me as a reader. Zoro versus Ryuma. A couple of things about this fight my editor brought to my attention was that the character of Ryuma is based on a character Oda created for an entirely different one-shot manga called 
Monsters! Which, on its own, is a neat little factoid about this battle, but what I loved most about it was how it was structured. You see, the entire fight itself takes place in a sort of flashback, which not only is a unique way to mix things up in delivering the conclusion of a fight sequence, but it's also used to tremendous effect in this particular case. The fight begins, strangely enough, at the very end of it, with Zoro looking as though he had completely lost. As we continue through the manga, what follows this is, as I said earlier, the entire fight taking place in a flashback. The interesting part being that right now we think that we know the ending, which, as I explained in my Alabasta video, is something known as dramatic irony. Or at least, we think we do. Throughout the entire fight, we have a sinking feeling in the back of our minds that despite Zoro's best efforts here, he's destined to lose. However, as it happens, as a nice swerve, how we interpreted the ending of this fight scene when we were first shown it was incorrect. Zoro, despite having a lot of trouble with this undead samurai, manages to put him away, proving that he is deserving of one day becoming the greatest swordsman in the land. And so, not only did this fight scene provide a nice little character moment here and there for Zoro, not only did it employ an interesting format, but it also elevated both of the warriors involved, which isn't a small feat at all. And with this victory under his belt, Zoro also returns to the body of Brook, his shadow, for the first time in many, many years. <laughs> Usopp versus Perona. This fight is fantastic, and in my humble opinion is the best fight in this entire arc. Using established techniques like those ghosts that inject negative emotions and a host of goofy things supplied by Usopp, this fight serves to demonstrate why he is such a phenomenally useful character, and acts on its own as a perfect case study for how you should use your weaker characters to great effect in a fight scene. Demonstrated earlier in the arc as the first creature they see, these ghosts commanded by Perona suck the joy out of a person leaving them in an unmotivated, un enthusiastic heap on the floor. This was played for laughs a large number of times throughout the arc on various characters like Sanji, Luffy, and Zoro, rendering them entirely useless momentarily. But in this sequence, in this fight against Usopp, those ghosts have zero effect on the sniper, as he is already terrified and as down as he possibly can be. It's tremendously sad, but while this works as a great gag, it also serves to emphasize how utterly gutsy and courageous Usopp needs to be at all times in order to operate while being so completely and utterly defeated in his mind. It shows how much he cares for his friends for him to be able to work through something like this on a consistent basis. And in addition to that, this fight sequence forces Usopp to use his head, his lies finally work, and all of his cheap tricks hit their mark, leaving Perona in an emotional heap the same way she leaves her opponents. It was such a fun, unpredictable, and character-rich sequence that proved to be an easy highlight amidst this arc. And okay, so I'm about to dive into my opinion on some things I didn't like as much. I'll try to justify every conclusion I've come to as clearly as I can, so all right, let's dive in. Sanji versus the Invisible Beast guy. Okay, so I'll start things off with a few minor things. This might very well be the Irish Catholic upbringing that's making me cringe during these moments or causing me to find them overly crass, but that one scene where the Invisible guy does some truly despicable things to Nami in the shower really made me feel uncomfortable. I can see that this could have been a tribute to those famous shower scenes from horror films, but jeez, does this go on for a long time and is immediately followed by a gag with Usopp. I understand that this is meant to make us hate this Invisible Leopard character, but I felt as though it took a few steps too far, considering this is a manga for kids at the end of the day. With that said, however, the character who assaulted Nami and Robin is confronted by the White Knight Sanji, later in the arc during one of the fight sequences. Now, as you might remember, I specifically didn't like this fight scene and mentioned so above. Not necessarily because I thought it was poorly choreographed or uninteresting visually, I thought it even had some interesting moments here and there in terms of character, but Unlike the rest of the fights, which served to elevate the characters involved respectively, this actively made me dislike Sanji more. If any of you follow me on Twitter, you'll know that my favorite character in One Piece was Sanji. And I also hated this invisible character, so I was more than invested in watching him be destroyed by Sanji, who, leading up to this fight, expressed rage when he heard the news about how he treated and attacked the girls of the Straw Hat crew. And while he is angry at this fact, it's revealed during this fight that a large portion of what made him so 
intensely angry about it was that he was also looking specifically for that devil fruit the invisible leopard man was using. And in this sequence, Sanji flat out admits to being just as bad as this guy that we all hate, wanting to use it for awful, awful things as well. And what's even more confusing to me is that this is played for laughs. As I said, this sort of tainted the character of Sanji for me. He's also a sucker for the ladies, so I hope that gag doesn't get old too fast. Yikes. Called it. Perhaps I didn't fully understand him as a character leading up to this correctly, but to me, up until this point, I always saw him as more of a Brock from Pokemon type character. One that idolizes women and wants to always sweep them off their feet. He saw them as people to fight for and to die for. And this is a flaw on its own, sure, but it's a flaw that comes from a good place. Up until this point, for me, Sanji had been walking this fine line of a lovable idiot obsessed with chivalry. But in this scene, he openly admits to be as gross as the character I honestly hated, and to me, that made me like him a whole lot less, taking from him what was for me an interesting layer of complexity and replacing it with an extremely uninteresting and tired anime trope that I personally never found particularly funny. Again, maybe this is the Irish Catholic upbringing in me, but that sort of stuff never resonated with me in any meaningful way. Now, if any of you guys disagree, I'd be interested to hear your arguments in the comment section down below, or if you really want to at me on Twitter, you can do so too. Big the third act. Personally, I found that unlike all of the other arcs in One Piece that all seem to have paced themselves really well for me in the past, this arc's final act really dragged its feet up until Moria was defeated for me. While I thought the concept of a giant monster Luffy was interesting, forcing the crew to deal with him while Luffy is off getting a super buff power up, I thought that once the personality of Luffy faded into the background, he became the single most boring opponent in the show for me. Without a personality to latch onto that drives the decisions he's making, I wasn't a big fan, he's just a zombie like every other one. And I think Oda recognized that too, as almost immediately after that personality vanished, Moria starts piloting him like the empty vessel he is. Which is good news, but unfortunately for this arc, I wasn't a big fan of this fight with Moria either. But that's not to say that I didn't like aspects of it, I simply don't know very much about Moria as a character. For example, unlike Alabasta that spent a considerable amount of time in various scenes in various scenarios developing and establishing the rich personality of Croc for us, the audience, Moria isn't revealed until halfway through the story and is in very few scenes that show his personality or motivating factors. On the flip side, I can imagine a lot of people don't like his design, but as a character with this specific Devil Fruit ability, I thought the fact that his silhouette was so unique made him a perfect design for both the theme of this world and a perfect fit for that ability. But by the time Dr. Hogback was defeated, I felt a lot of the emotional weight behind the crimes committed by these bad guys had been dealt with before even beginning the fight with Moria. But that isn't even my biggest issue with the character. His moveset seems to come out of nowhere. Typically, when a Devil Fruit power is established, the powers are either explained, shown, or understood before the climax decides it needs to depend on them to work. But in this final fight, it honestly felt as though Moria was inventing powers on the fly to extend the fight beyond a natural conclusion. So, let me explain. Crocodile could do fantastical things with his sand powers, but they were always either foreshadowed or had something inherently known about sand as a material used within it, like its ability to dehydrate something. We all know that sand does that. That's an attribute of sand that exists that people are aware of, and as a result, that doesn't necessarily need to be explained or foreshadowed to us, the audience, as it should be derivative of his particular ability. Whereas swapping places with your shadow as well as a host of random powers more seem to have with this particular devil fruit ability seem to come out of absolutely nowhere just to create more trouble than it should have been at the time. These weren't subversions, these were just pulled out of nowhere, and it was all the more unsatisfying for it for me. Now, that's not to say there weren't aspects of this final fight that I enjoyed tremendously, in fact there's quite a lot. 
I really enjoyed that Moria isn't the typical cool looking villain, but more importantly, I specifically adore that he takes the combined efforts of all the Straw Hats to defeat him at the end of the day, with several characters like Chopper utilizing what makes them special to identify weak spots and to form a strategy to defeat him. But even acknowledging that, we get awesome scenes like this one where Robin outplays him in a physical game of chess, and in a really brutal way too, which is totally elevating her in my favorite character list. But more importantly, this was an incredibly satisfying sequence because she overcame in a creative way what we already understood were the established parameters of this particular exchange. Moria comes out of nowhere with an ability that was not foreshadowed, explained, or derived from what we understood about shadows. Completely sucking the earned tension out of the scene, and I say that not because I wanted Robin to win per se, I honestly don't really care who gets to win in this case, I only care about how the narrative in a fight scene adheres to certain rules in order to achieve a desired effect. If all the characters did in the scene was pull out made up moves out of nowhere all the time, then that would be really boring. What makes a fight scene interesting for me anyway is the creativity employed by the author in deriving surprise or tension utilizing what we already understood about the scene or characters involved. In this particular case, Oda has Moria effectively say, <laughs> You activated my trap card! Which honestly really sucked me out of the entire occasion. Luffy also during this section I thought felt a little weird. I thought the idea of him absorbing the powers of all the shadows was sort of cool and, you know, sort of kept in theme with the idea of everyone in this world working together to overcome Moria, but when he says this quote, there's only one Luffy and it's me, while roided out on the power of a hundred other people that aren't Luffy, I had a bit of a chuckle I have to admit. But anyway, even after this roided out attack on Moria, if you thought he was done at this point, you're sorely mistaken. Moria gets up after seemingly being defeated for the third time and absorbs the powers of a thousand shadows, effectively giving himself a tummy ache, defeating himself. But perhaps the most ludicrous part of this entire fight was its ending. Earlier in this arc, it's established that Moria can't simply be defeated for the shadows to all return to the Straw Hats and the other people they were taken from. He needs to volunteer choose to relinquish these shadows and send them back to their respective owners. And at the end of this arc, he decides that the new world will take care of them and give them everything they deserve. He does this despite the fact that everyone is literally seconds away from being erased. He does this being seconds away from winning. He didn't even need to fight anymore. He could have quite literally done nothing and won, but he didn't. Instead, he chose to give up at literally the last possible second. This is akin to being infinity points up in the NBA Finals with one second left on the clock, forfeit the match. That wasn't what I wanted from this occasion. And that pretty much covers everything that I didn't like, really. And to be honest, it felt a little weird to criticize One Piece so continuously, but hey, time for some more peak One Piece that picks up immediately after this. The ending of the arc. Okay, this was friggin' amazing. Like, not at all what I was expecting. Especially after the lukewarm finish I experienced with the conclusion of the last fight, but this fight sequence really impressed me. Not because it was particularly flashy, though it did have some of its moments for sure, but because of the character writing that was on display throughout. The development on behalf of the entire Straw Hat crew is abundantly clear. So this warlord Bartholomew Kuma guy arrives and is just the most intimidating person we've met so far. He's completely completely no nonsense and all about following the orders of the government. And once his eyes are set on the unconscious Luffy and the Straw Hats, he systematically plows through each and every one of them with little to no effort. Yet in a defiant, brilliant panel, they all defiantly scream, that they will never give up on defending their captain. It's a beautiful moment, however, moments later, with absolute ease, he renders each and every one of the Straw Hats unconscious. Well, almost everyone. <laughs> Zoro once again steps up to the plate being an absolute legend with lines like, when disaster looms, you've got to step up or shove off. Making excuses isn't going to change anything. If I die here, then I wasn't worth much to begin with. As an absolute last resort, understanding that he can't win in this situation, Zoro offers up his head in place of Luffy's. Sanji objects to this, but very quickly, Zoro shuts him down. In accepting this sacrifice, Kuma extracts all the suffering Luffy endured during this battle and offers it to Zoro to hold and bear for him, resulting in... 
ここで何があった何もなかった This arc finishes incredibly strong, with not just moments like I spoke about regarding Zoro, but also with delivering backstories for new additions like Brooke, and in a shocking turn of events that I absolutely did not see coming. I'm serious. Had you given me a hundred years, I wouldn't have remembered that small plotline from Reverse Mountain. But as it turns out, <laughs> Brooke is the last surviving crew member from the Rumber Pirates, the very pirates that befriended Laboon and left him waiting over 50 years ago. This added for me much needed complexity to Brooke as a character, presenting him as someone that stresses and worries about keeping his afro, not necessarily just because he likes it, but because he's actually aware of it being possibly the only part of him that Laboon himself will remember, along with one other token that left me in tears. There's a beautifully intimate scene at the very end of this arc between Luffy, Brooke, and a piano, wherein Brooke begins lamenting over his past, what he's lost, and the story of how he got to where he is, communicated through a fittingly haunting rendition of a song by the name of Binx's Sake, sung by him and his crew as they fall away one by one before leaving him alone. It's a beautiful scene that paints Brooke as a very lonely soul, feeling isolated and lost in a room filled with people. But this time it's different. He's not alone, and in a very real way this time, he's accepted into the crew by Luffy. And so, I guess Luffy's finally found the musician he's been looking to recruit since the beginning of the story. But even that's not the most entertaining part, if you'll believe it. Earlier in the story, Kuma announces that Blackbeard, whom we last saw clashing with Ace, is being chosen as Crocodile's replacement as one of the seven warlords of the sea. We also learn that whatever happened between Blackbeard and Ace, it resulted in Blackbeard getting away and Ace being taken prisoner by the government. Well, if that wasn't enough, at the very end of this arc, we learn that the piece of paper Ace gave Luffy in Alabasta all those chapters ago is a piece of verve or life paper. Essentially, for all intents and purposes, this connects Luffy to Ace, allowing him to find him more easily. And according to that piece of paper, in Luffy's possession, Ace is barely hanging on. Which is incredibly exciting, sad, but exciting and interesting to hear. So I guess that's where we're going next? Despite this arc being much less consistent in terms of entertainment for me when compared with the rest, I still very much enjoyed my time towards the beginning and most definitely after its main events ended. The conclusions to this arc are nothing short of harrowing, heroic, and haunting, with Zoro for the first time in a very long while being the standout character. To be honest, the focus has been primarily on so many other characters in the past few arcs that all Zoro's done over the last couple of arcs has speak every now and again before fighting the second strongest guy. And he does amazingly well in that role. But this arc's conclusion for me cemented him as one of the absolute best fits as Luffy's number two. As for Brook, someone I honestly didn't enjoy much of early on due to the crass nature he was introduced with, very quickly became more of a character I could sink my teeth into. With, once again, the conclusion to this arc managing to flesh out this old bag of bones all the more. There's a pun for you right there that hasn't been used. I'm now halfway through my adventure through the high seas of One Piece as I endeavor to catch up with the rest of the world. And with the Nightmare Before Christmas style story that was Thriller Bark, now in the books, despite its downsides, I'm still very happy I checked it out and finished it. There were some truly interesting touching and well-written scenes throughout, it just so happened to be dragged down by a very ill-conceived villain, in my opinion, with some pacing issues. Join me next week as I continue down the road on this adventure. And don't forget, if you want to support the channel, check out One Punch Man Road to Hero 2.0, using the link in the description. But that'll do it for this video. I've been Totally Not Mark, I'll see you all next week, and thank you so much for watching.